Buddy, what is cooking? What is cooking with you? Hey, man, this is Green Bean, and welcome to episode 65 of Green Beans Jets Pod. Watch this. Poof. You like that? See how I did that? Magic. We're starting this one with magical stuff for you. That's how we do it here. At Green Beans Jets Pod, I want to welcome you. I want to welcome all of the new people that have been pouring in. I am very, very grateful, and I'm happy to have you here. I see all kinds of new commenters and fans from other teams are hanging out and chatting with us, and I always love that. And I want you to know, as long as you're not a Packerhead, you're welcome to. It's like when guys come here and say, the Jets suck. Like, no shit. All right? Like, no, yeah, ooh, <laughs> like we don't know. We're the ones here, man. We live in it. You know, we live in it. You suck. Yeah, congrats for your brilliant take. <laughs> as long as you're not doing that, you're welcome. Let's talk football, man. Let's talk. Got all sorts of stuff to talk about. So I want to welcome you guys here. And to everybody who's been here the whole time, man, thank you. Thank you. I want to make an announcement this week. We just passed, as of a couple days ago, April 2nd, 6,000 subs. Less than 15 months, we got to 6,000 subscribers. And we're flying right through 6,000, which is just amazing, man. I never even thought that this channel would be a thing. I really didn't. So I'm grateful, I'm happy, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's a good time to do it. Join up, man. Join us. Join us. Come on in, man. We're nice in here. We're just having a good time talking about stuff, you know? But 6,000 subs is a big deal from my perspective, and I am grateful. So if you haven't subscribed... Come on in, hit that rectangular red button. It says subscribe. The jolly candy-like button! And another thing you can do, hit that thumbs up button. It lets YouTube know, hey, this guy's all right. You know what I mean? You hit the little thumbs, you hit the little subscribe, and all is well, and it means a lot to the channel. And if you're looking for additional content, if what I'm saying here and doing in this podcast here doesn't meet your goals, you need more, you can always go and click on that link right in the top of the description for my Patreon weekly exclusive content there we have extra time together we do private mocks and private positional breakdowns and we watch classic jets games this month actually it's this week this wednesday night we are watching the 2001 chad pennington versus peyton manning playoffs as you know we won the game. So we're going to... I, I got to say, honestly, I don't think I'm going to watch too many losses. <laughs> when we're watching a classic Jets game, you got a pretty good idea that we're going to have won that one that we're re-watching. To hang out with a bunch of Jets fans, watching classic games, walking down memory lane. And you can do all that by subscribing to the Patreon right in the link in this description. And that is greatly appreciated as well. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I have to be honest. We are now in the month of April, okay? And I got very little else on my mind these days other than the draft. So it's going to be draft content from here on out, man. We have stuff to discuss. We must talk draft. Now we can talk trades. We can talk free agency if things happen, of course. But it's all draft all the time. And that's what we're going to do today. We are going to get into the best case scenario from my perspective. But I got a bonus for you. It's not just the best case scenario in one instance. There are two best case scenarios. How can that be? Well, one's going to be just straight up, if we stayed where we were, what would be the best case scenario for the Jets if we just stayed put and took our nine picks from pick four to pick 163 and we went that way? The other one is what if we started out with a big old-fashioned trade rooney So we'll get that going and see what it could look like uh, in just a few minutes. But first, I want to get into... What's been going on? A few things have happened for the Jets this week. So let's get into it with our segment, the news of the week. What? 
So, as we know, the Jets' brass was down there in West Palm Beach, Florida, at the NFL owners' meetings, and they were being interviewed. We saw some Salah action, we saw some Joe Douglas action, and a few interesting nuggets floated out of that that we want to discuss. We want to make sure that we take a deeper look at, right? So, one of the things that Salah said that I think just supersedes everything else, he talked about players, he talked about Beckton, he talked about this guy and that guy and trades and blah, but he said this. When talking about the team itself, he said, number one, we're still young. You got guys, they were rookies last year, and they come back for year two. Guess what? They're still young. They're still new to this thing, and they're still young players. So we have to remember that going into this year. We have guys, they'll be coming in after their first NFL offseason. This is the first time that they'll have the whole year with our doctors, our nutritionists, our medical staff, our trainers, the whole regimen, whether they need to gain strength, they need to put on a few pounds, take off a few pounds. That's what they're going to be focusing on in the offseason. We know that Zach Wilson is making his little tour with his wide receivers, his skill players. So they're actually getting some extra time in as well so it's their first year as a team all these young guys we have to remember that going into their rookie year it's like the big hubbub of their of their final year in college right they make the big decision to go into the nfl draft then they have the combine then they have pro days then they have the draft and all this emotional stuff rookie minicamp otas it just never stops for the whole year so it can be quite daunting. And then they're they're coming up. They Think about that. They're doing all that. And then they step it up to a higher level of competition. So it can be an exhausting process for these guys. So now they finished their rookie season. Took a whole lot of lumps, right? They took a whole lot of lumps. A whole lot of lumps. <laughs> oh, say about three or four, right? They did that. And now they get to take a break. They know who's on their team. They know who the quarterback is. They know who who's my other wide receiver. Where's my running back? They know who each other are. They know their trainers. They know their doctors. They know what the team wants them to do. They have a pretty good idea of the expectations. So they're going to be able to do all of that this offseason and come into mini camps, OTAs, and training camp with a whole head filled with new York Jets and only New York Jets, which is, in my opinion, going to be very beneficial because it just so happens that we are one of the youngest teams in the entire NFL. We started more rookies than any other team in the league last year, and we were like first or second in rookie snaps. So guys, our core, our foundation is super young. So Salah was talking about that, but here's what he said, and this dovetails with free agency. And it's so important. This is the difference and why it's going to take a little bit longer. And I'm totally fine with it. He said, we don't have one player on this team that is here because we overpaid them. Not one. Every single player on this team is here because they want to be here. Or we stole them and drafted them and locked them into a four-year contract. <laughs> One or the other. But either they're rookies, you know, on their rookie contract. But any free agent that is here is here because they want to be here. They didn't go out there and overpay someone four or five million dollars just to get them in here. We've seen the Jets do that many times in the past. And it doesn't work. What happens when a guy's here specifically for the money? What happens when shit goes wrong? The, you know, everything hits the fan, you know, that, you know, the fans are booing you, the press is writing bad things. Yeah, you figure, I'm going to mail it in. You get a little toe injury and you say, yep, I'm out for five weeks, I'm going to go take a break. Because you're not invested in it. You're here for the money. If things aren't going well, you're more inclined to just sit down, take a break, work at half speed. Why am I going to sacrifice my body and my potential future contracts for this team, that sucks. That's what we're not doing this year. And we've done it many times in the past. It did not work for us. And this is what we're doing now. Now, did we go out there and scrape the bottom of the barrel? No. We got Lake and Tomlinson. We got Jordan Whitehead. We got DJ Reed. We got Conklin and Uzoma. So we did a lot of ascending guys, guys that are still young. Like, look at DJ Reed. He's 25 years old. Right, So he's not old by any stretch, but he's an ascending player over 
being blown away, the agent saying, look, man, you're not going to get another offer like this, which is exactly what happened with C.J. Mosley and Le'Veon Bell and all that stuff. That's why they're here. Now, C.J. Mosley's been fantastic and, you know, great. It is what it is, but let, make no mistake. C.J. Mosley left the Baltimore Ravens, who had a 12, I think they had a $12 million contract on the table for him. We offered him 17 and change. His agent said, I'm just going to tell you, C.J., you're never going to see another contract like this in your life. This is ridiculous. We got to take it. C.J. Mosley said, yeah, 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 I'll take that. It's an extra $40 million bucks for the same time frame. You know what I mean? So that's what... So that that's what was so interesting about what Salah said. We're not going that route. We're not trying to panic. He also said that. We're not panicked. We don't feel like we need to do anything. When they talked about Tyreek Hill, a lot of people are absorbing that as if the Jets are desperate for a wide receiver. We're willing to do anything. We know it's a huge hole and Denzel Mims sucks and CJ Mo or uh, uh, Corey Davis sucks. All we have is Elijah Moore and Berrios and we need it. We need it. We need it. That's he's dude. He said no. It was an opportunity for an obviously elite player, and we took a swing. He said Joe takes out his baseball bat and he takes a swing. Didn't work. No sweat. No sweat. We got nine draft picks, four of them in the top forty. Skiddly doo. It's not a big deal. So if they see opportunities, they want to have enough flexibility to do it. But there's no panic. There's no desperation, and there's no one here that doesn't want to be here, which is so good, man. That's how you build a core. That's how you build guys who are invested in what they're doing here. Young guys who still want to build their career, they chose here because they see it on the rise. They like to work for Robert Sala. Joe Douglas is a very respectable GM. He handles himself in a very professional manner. Whatever it is that was the attraction here, they're here because they chose to be here. They all had other options, of course. So that's the difference. Now, a thing that Joe Douglas said, he talked quite a, you know, he talked about quite a few things. He said that the Jets were actually trying to be aggressive this year, which is something that we talked about quite often. You know, we talk about Joe Douglas and his one-year contracts, and oh my God, can he ever sign anybody? He doesn't keep his own players. Like, we're dumping years and years of Jets problems on this guy who just got here and identified that we need to tear this thing down. This, this Dude, this place sucks. There's nothing worth... The only thing worth anything here is the land. I got to tear the structures down, and we're going to build something new. I'm not going to try to spiff up a, 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 a rotten barn. You know what I mean? Like, we're not going to paint rotten wood. It's not what we're going to do here. So he's going to tear it all down. The land is very valuable. Let's build something really new and fresh on it, right? So he said we want to be aggressive, but we don't want to be reckless. And he talked about being very, very close to signing guys. So they were in a battle with some other team for a player. So we were in it right to the end. It was bordering on being reckless. So we had to stand down. We pulled back. Why? Because he doesn't want to get into this situation that you see so many teams doing in this particular offseason. They're trying to dump salaries. He doesn't want to be in that scenario where he has to move people to do anything. He's got his coaching staff one year under their belt. He's got his quarterback one year under his belt. He's, he has tons of cap dollars that he cleaned out because McCagnin's dead cap. We were one of the, I think we had $37 million in dead cap last year. So he had to wait all that out, clean it all out. He's got the money. He got rid of players for the draft picks. This is the year he gets to use it, which is just so funny that we complain and yell, he sucks. When we didn't even let him use all the assets he compiled. Why don't we wait and see, you know? So this is the year that he has the money, he has the uh, the draft picks, and he's going to go out there and use them. He wants to be more aggressive. And I think we saw that. Two tight ends, Pro Bowl right guard, you know, a, a cornerback, a safety. We see all these guys. We're seeing him put larger investments into players, but again, he's not being stupid. He's not just blowing guys' doors off with big dollars but now he has the draft picks and when he talked about that was he said we have four top 40 draft picks this can be an incredible opportunity to change this franchise now who did that he did that so he went out there created scenarios where he has two firsts two seconds a third two fourths 
and two fists. Now, what are the fourths and fifths? Well, the fourths and fifths, the, the reason we have two of them is because like the, the two fourths, for example, is that he made a sixth into a fourth by getting rid of who? Chris Herndon. So rather than having one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, one seventh, he took those picks, did things, made moves to make those picks into earlier picks, which is also, I mean, it's a very strong move. It's not, you know, grabbing another first, but I'll tell you what, you'd rather have two fourths than a fourth and a sixth. I'm just saying, and that's the way it looks. So it's a, it's an interesting thing when you hear these guys talk. And now, of course, they're not going to show too much of their hand, right? They're not going to show us and tell us too much of what they're thinking. Look at the Tyree Kill trade. Nobody knew that. We found out later they were already in negotiations for almost a week. They had the deal accepted by the Chiefs. They were done with their end. And before we even knew about it. So Joe Douglas and, and Steph, they're not telling anybody anything that uh, that's going to give us too much of an indicator of the actual direction they're going. But they are telling us, look, we're done overpaying people. We're done being reckless. We're going to have people playing here that want to play here. We're not going to run out there like a panicked and desperate organization and make moves because we feel like we have to. Joe Douglas has four years left on his contract. Robert Sala has four years left on his contract. They're fine. They're going to do this the nice, slow way. And it's nice to hear them having that understanding. When's the last time we heard a general manager or a coach talk about that? We want guys who want to be here. We're tired of overpaying people. We're not paying people more just to play for us. We don't want it. That's not what we're doing here. And I think that's very, very refreshing. And we heard them talk about that. Now, there's lots of other stuff that they said, but I think that's really the larger piece to everything that we saw them talking about down at the owners' meetings Good stuff for the Jets moving forward. Now, what else happened this week with the owners' meetings? We talked about uh, changing the overtime rules. Man, have they overcomplicated this forever. I tell, you know what I mean? How long does it take 32 owners to do something simple? Clearly, it takes 50 years because this is the simplest thing in the whole wide world. Us as fans have been talking about this forever. Give both teams an opportunity to score. Or how about this? Play a 10-minute quarter. Whatever. Just give both teams equal shake in the game. A whole game of war for 60 minutes. A really passionate battle that ended in a tie. Shouldn't come down to a coin flip. That's not the way it should be. So finally, we see the NFL owners get a little bit of sense and change the overtime rules to give both teams equal opportunity to score. It seems like it's so simple. Clearly it wasn't. But I have to say, I'm very, very happy about it. I hated the overtime rules. Think about after that fourth quarter bell goes off and your teams walk out to the middle. You're praying, please let us get the ball. Please let us get the ball. Why? Because that you know that's the only chance you have. It's the only chance you have. I mean, of course, the defense can stop them, and we hear all that. It's all baloney. Both teams should have the same exact opportunity to win. End of story. And I think this will be pretty good. As we know, it's only for the playoffs, not for the regular season. Hey, we'll take it. Those are the most important games. So, good. At least we won't see this baloney coming out after games. Oh, they didn't get a chance and all this shit. And, you know, because look. It's true. If one team just drives down and scores a touchdown, why can't they have a shot, right? So I applaud the NFL for finally getting their heads out of their ass. Yay! Common sense. Good. Good for you, NFL. And that's good news. The Jets also brought in another free agent, Solomon Thomas, which I think is a fantastic move. Now, is it going to make it so they're going to cut Sheldon Rankins? Probably not. Does it mean that we're all set in the interior of our line? Probably not. But he is a pretty damn good piece to the interior defensive line rotation. We know Salah's worked with him for years, knows him very, very well. He's labeled as a bust because of where he was taken in the draft. Totally. He's taken, what, fourth overall in the 2017 draft or something? So he's definitely not met expectations, but that's okay. We're not expecting too much. We want a solid player that can produce in a rotational capacity, and I think that we did that. Again, 
Sala knows him very, very well. He had a decent year last year for the Raiders. He went up there for one year. He got uh, four sacks, 35 tackles or so, and uh, rotational spot duty. So I think that's pretty good. That's all you're looking for. If all of our rotational guys got four or five sacks, we'd be good. We are right. That's all we're asking for. So I think Solomon Thomas is a pretty damn good move, and I like it. So that's what's going on in Jetland and NFL land this week. Now we're gonna get into the drafts. Yeah! All right. <laughs> So, like I said earlier, we are going to do, from my perspective, two of the best case scenarios that we can present. Now, first, I'm going to hit you with a best case scenario, but everything is going to be realistic, okay? But a best case scenario, nonetheless, without trades. Let's say we just stay where we are, no moving up or down, we're just going to stick there. How I see a very realistic possibility rolling down the pike for the Jets and in a way that we can significantly improve this team in our key spots to make us better, right? That's all we're trying to do. This isn't the year they have to get to the playoffs. Joe Douglas is on the hot seat. I disagree with every single sentiment that implies such things. Joe Douglas, Robert Sala, they're not on the hot seat. They're not getting fired this year. This year, what they need to do is get better, and they need to think like that. If you start panicking and you start reaching for need and getting all nuts, it ends up blowing in your face. Systematic, nice, strong, the best possible assets that you can acquire in the drift. That's the way to go. So let's start with the one with no trades and then we'll get into the one with all kinds of fun stuff up top, okay? So first I want to tell you, I'll give you the first four picks just so you know exactly what I'm talking about here. Now, we don't know the way that the draft is going to go. We know this, right? It's always a little bit different than we think. It's pretty, and I'll tell you what, we do a better job nailing down the first five picks a lot of the time, but many times we don't even get that right. Okay, like last year, we knew Trevor Lawrence was going first. We knew more than likely Zach Wilson was going second to the Jets, but we did not know who the 49ers were picking. A lot of people said Trey Lance. There was a very strong contingent saying that the 49ers love Mac Jones. And then four, we didn't know what the Atlanta Falcons were going to do. We all thought the Cincinnati Bengals were going to take Panay Sewell. Right? It, was, it blew everybody's doors off when they took a wide receiver over the left tackle after Joe Burrow got his leg ripped off from not having any protection. So it seemed like it made a ton of sense, but nobody really knows. Okay, nobody really knows. So I think that it's very realistic that the first four picks go as follows. Number one, Jacksonville knows that they need this golden boy, Trevor Lawrence, to be just that. They need it. They have this asset. They can't just look at him like, ah, well, you know, we'll do whatever, and if he doesn't make it, we'll get another quarterback. No, you got arguably one of the best quarterback prospects in the last decade. So... You want to do what? You want to ensure that he succeeds. How do you do that? Well, first, you got to protect the damn guy. They they brought in some wide receiver help. They also got some wide receivers from previous drafts. They have uh, Travis Etienne coming back. They already have a decent running game. So they're going to be looking to protect him. And I think that they're going to go for the cleanest tackle in the entire draft. Maybe not the best, but the cleanest. And I think that's Evan Neal. So they're going to start this draft with Evan Neal being the number one overall pick. And I think it's a good pick for them. Go ahead, bring him in. Now we got the Detroit Lions. There are so many rumors swirling. They're going to trade back. They love this guy. They love that guy. The obvious pick is for them to keep Aiden Hutchinson up there in Michigan. Just makes too much sense. They're not going to do that. They're going to go ahead and make a smart move, but also a panic move because they're Detroit, and they're going to take quarterback Malik Willis. In their opinion, he's the best quarterback. They love him, and he's not going to make it to their next pick. There's just no way. They have to take him. If they want him, they got to take him now. They can get edge rushers later. It's considered a deep class if they want to do that. They're going to take Malik Willis at number two, and they're going to remove him off the board, which, because they did that, the Jets trade back options. There were some teams that wanted to jump up. They're not going to happen because 
the reason that they would happen is now gone. So Detroit takes Malik Willis. Now, what are the Texans going to do? The Texans are probably the worst team in the NFL the last three or four years with what they've done. Guys, they were a division championship team. They had Deshaun Watson. They had Hop. They had such a strong roster. J.J. Watt and Clowney and all the guys. They chose to destroy it. I don't know why, but I don't think that their head is completely removed from their bootacle. I think it's still up there, evidenced by their recent head coaching baloney. They they hired Cully for one year. Why? And then they fired him. He did a good job. You fired David Cully, and they wanted to hire McCown. Why? Why? You guys never coached in any capacity. He was been an NFL quarterback. And let me just share with you, he's not been a good NFL quarterback. He's fine. Everybody likes him. What has he done? He's done nothing. They were going to make him the head coach, but they couldn't because of the Brian Flores, uh, you know, claims and all that kind of stuff. They just couldn't do it. Now, Lovey Smith is a fantastic coach, but I think we all know that. But still, they're just doing things. They're being knocked around all over the place. Lovey Smith is there, and they're taking the best player in the draft by many people's assertions. They're going to go ahead and take Kyle Hamilton off of the board. I thought maybe giving them a tackle, I don't know, maybe Thibodeau, but they didn't happen. So they're taking Kyle Hamilton, and you know what that leaves for the Jets? It leaves our number one edge rusher on our board, and we're going to get Aiden Hutchinson at pick four. You see, it's not even unrealistic. People think that Aiden Hutchinson is definitely going to be off the board, and there's a good chance he is, but there's also a good chance he's not. This is a realistic uh, scenario, and the Jets get Aiden Hutchinson. Now, that brings us to pick number 10. Numerous things we can do. We weren't able to pull off a trade in the offseason for a wide receiver, so we're going to get this done. We're not going to play games. The best guy on their board from a health standpoint, in addition to talent, is Garrett Wilson. They're grabbing him. They're taking the Ohio State wide receiver, six foot, 203 pounds. They're going to pair him with Elijah Moore and our big 12 personnels. We got tight ends and running backs, and, and we're going to have two shifty ass dudes run, pew, 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 and they're going to be lighting teams up. It's going to be a fantastic combo. Garrett Wilson at pick 10. And then that leaves us at pick 35. Now, we were considering linebacker at pick 10. Again, we thought if we were able to bring in maybe a wide receiver in the offseason, we could do that. Maybe we'd go linebacker. That's another position that we want, but we didn't. We just wanted to get wide receiver done. So now we're going to go linebacker, and it's a little bit surprising. Christian Harris is there. Chad Moom is there. Quay Walker's there. And they're going to go for the guy that they think is going to thump the living hell out of running backs and tight ends for the next 10 years. And they're going to grab Leo Chanel from Wisconsin. 260 pound thumptitude. They're bringing him in at pick 35, 6'2, 260, and they love him. Little bit out of character for Robert Sala. He's been bringing in tweeners. So now he's got CJ Mosley, Jamie and Sherwood, and Leo Chanel in there. And they're just gonna they're gonna be able to cover. They're gonna be able to do everything that they want to do. Um Hamsa Nasraldine and Quincy Wilson or Williams backing them up. Nice, strong linebacker group now. Then they're going to continue to stay defense because why? It's strong defensive class up top. We already injected a little offense in there to help Zach Wilson. Wide receiver Garrett Wilson. We went edge. We went wide receiver. We went linebacker. And now we're going to go safety. Why? Because it's a strong safety class. And it just so happens that we need one. We're looking for a little bit more free safety action than we are strong safety. So we're going to grab Penn State's Jaquan Brisker. Six foot, 210 pounds. And he's going to fit in beautifully with our defense. I think he's a very strong safety. There were other safeties that I considered here. But. I'm just going with Brisker. I think he's a strong candidate. Now, pick 69. What do we do? We were thinking tight ends. We were thinking some running back action. But we're going to go ahead and start our interior offensive line pipeline. So we're going to bring in a guy that can play guard and tackle. And we're going to grab the best guard, the best interior offensive lineman on the board Tyler Smith out of Tulsa. You love it. Tyler Smith, six foot five, 330 pounds. Very strong and getting better. 
He's going to be a great fit, and we're starting to step up our interior pipeline. This guy is going to be there for years to come for us, and it's going to be nice. Look, we're really surprised in the fourth round. Here we are again. The last two years, Joe Douglas has taken what position in the fourth round? Running back, and we're going to do it again. We can't believe this guy slid through the third round. He's probably looked at as maybe an end of the second, third round pick, but just like Michael Carter, he pops through to the fourth round. We scoop him up at pick 111, and that is James Cook, the running back out of Georgia. Now, we might have pushed running back till the next pick, but we can't believe he's there. So we're going to grab him. 5'11", 190 pounds, and I think he is a fantastic compliment to Michael Carter. In truth, I think he might even be 1A in the group. There are other running backs that I personally like better. I'm trying to think that of how the Jets are going to look at this. I think James Cook is a fantastic running back. I love him. So we're going to grab him here at pick 111. Then we go back to the offensive line because there is a stud sitting right there to back up the tackle position. Again, Tyler Smith can play tackle. AVT can play tackle. We still got Chuma Idoga and Connor McDermott back there playing tackle. But we're going to bring in Max Mitchell out of Louisiana, a, a raging Cajun. Six foot five, 300 pounds. The guy is a very strong candidate. Needs a little bit of work, okay? Needs a little bit of work, and this is exactly what we want. When we figure out what's going to go on with our tackle position next year, whatever it is, Max Mitchell is waiting right there to step in if we need him to, and he's going to eventually be our starting right tackle at some point. How that works, we'll see, but we got him. He's in the house, and it's a very strong pick at pick 117. Now we're going to go to pick 146, and again, this is a guy that probably should have been gone, but he's there nonetheless, and we're going to take tight end Jake Ferguson. Now this gives us a tight end room of Conklin, Uzoma, Kenny Yaboa, and now Jake Ferguson out of Wisconsin, six foot five, 246 pounds. Great pass catcher, very strong blocker, really good head on his shoulders, football smarts, work ethic, it's all there. We saw them use him in the Senior Bowl as well, scored a touchdown, had a few nice catches. He's exactly what we're looking for in the position, especially coming in late. He's going to be developmental to some respects, and we're going to now have two young guys backing up and kind of being brought up in our system, Griffin, Brown. Croft, and sadly to say, I even think more than likely Trevon Wesco might be gone. If they use Trevon Wesco as like a hybrid, you know, backing up the fullback, backing up the tight end thing, I can see it. I happen to like Trevon Wesco, but he can't seem to have an impact on the game all that much. Whatever the reason is, I'm not sure. But it might be time for him to go. Bringing in Jake Ferguson gives us the ability to consider that without any concern whatsoever. And now we're going to wrap it up with one of my secret little love bunnies of the year. You ready? We're going to take interior defensive lineman slash outside defensive lineman. He can play both. He needs work at both. But he's got the work ethic. He has the relentless motor. He's very much in the Aiden Hutchinson mold, albeit not as talented, not as athletic. But this is exactly the type of ball of clay you want to work with. And taking him with pick 163, it's beautiful. Maybe he might last another round, but they're going to grab him with their last pick. And that is Zach Von Valkenberg. That's right, you heard it. He is a Monday night 10 o'clock mock favorite. We haven't picked him in a little while, but the name alone gives him a leg up on many of the other candidates at the same time. So we're going to wrap it up with defensive lineman Zach Von, Von Valkenberg, 6'3", 270 pounds, and he's exactly, like I said, the type of guy you want to bring into your team. He never stops. One of his downsides, actually, is he's, he's a little bit uh, undisciplined as far as his technique. He's a little bit all over the place. He needs to settle down and kind of learn the technique, but as far as his willingness... His motor, it's all there, man. Coming out of Iowa, good guy to bring in. So there you go. We have Aiden Hutchinson, Garrett Wilson, Leo Chanel, Jaquan Brisker, Tyler Smith, James Cook, Max Mitchell, 
Jake Ferguson and Zach Von Volkenberg. I think it is a slam dunk draft. You'll notice no cornerbacks. Again, I'm sticking with my theme of this offseason. I don't think we're bringing in a cornerback. If we end up taking sauce, I could see that. Other than that, I don't think we're going cornerback in this draft. I think we're going to run it back with our with our uh, second year and third year players in addition to bringing on DJ Reed. Let's see how they do in their second year in the system. If we need to move on from one or two, we'll know. If not, we don't need to do anything at cornerback. We're good. So I think that's the way we're going to go. We have other places to fortify. So there you go. What do you think? Got a couple edges, got some linebacker action, got safeties, we got line, you know, offensive linemen, running back, wide receiver. We got it all covered. And I think when I looked at the board, where I was and all this, I didn't use a sim. This is my own boards. And I did, I used three boards to try to figure out exactly who's likely to be there and who's not and all that jazz. I think we did pretty damn well. And I think that we got excellent value at every single pick. The only little bit of a reach is Von Valkenberg. And he might go that early. I mean, I don't know. He's, he's probably the next. He's probably a sixth round, seventh round, maybe even an undrafted free agent. But, hey, I like to, I like to bring him in. It's our last pick. It's like, hey, take a shot on a guy with a relentless motor. So now... If that wasn't a good one for you, let's see what we could do with a little bit of trade action. Now, imagine this. You know, let's set the scene here. We're not able to do any of these fictitious trades we're hearing about, right? We don't do anything pre-draft. We're there. It's draft day. We're on the clock. On the clock. It says the Jets and the big screens and our flags are waving and Jets are on the clock and it's ticking down. And all of a sudden, we as Jets fans, we're talking about it. We're on Jets Talk 24-7, talking Jet Panel live draft coverage with O'Leary and Ryan. We're there doing the whole thing. And then all of a sudden, poof, trade. There has been a trade and then it switches to which team? Who is it? The Jets are trading out of four? Yeah, because this scenario is a bit different. It went Evan Neal, Aiden Hutchinson, Kayvon Thibodeau. Ooh, okay. Well, those are the guys that we had as four. We were considering Kyle Hamilton. But the Seattle Seahawks banner comes on the screen and they want to clean up this Jamal Adams trade. It's still out there lingering. We're going to wipe it clean. We're going to wipe the whole thing clean. Here's what happened. This is what we learned. Seattle wants pick four. They want a quarterback. So they're coming up. They want to get ahead of the, of the Panthers and everybody else. And even the Giants are maybe they're thinking about a quarterback. Daniel Jones isn't the guy. So the Seattle Seahawks want to come up. They want to grab a quarterback. So they're going to give us pick number nine, pick 109, and DK Metcalf for pick four. Now, just so we're clear, DK Metcalf was taken with pick 64. So he's a late second round pick when he comes into the league. He's done very, very well. Rumors are he's going to want a minimum of 22 to $25 million. That's what they're saying now, okay? Especially with all the contracts this year. Seattle Seahawks happen to have $44 million in dead cap this year. So, and they have lots of stuff to clean up with, with the mess that they've made over there. They're paying a lot of guys. So they're looking like, hey, let's restart this thing. Let's dump some salary and let's get some value for our player. So they're going to jump up five spots. They're going to give us DK Metcalf. When they add 109, there's two reasons for this. It actually makes DK's value right about 40. Okay, so he's an early second round pick. Of course, he could be seen as a first. We all know that. But we also know that Joe Douglas's uh, ability to trade, he's going to make things happen, which is why that you wait till the day of the draft. If they're thinking about it, this is it. They know if you're going to do it, you got to do it right now. That kind of energy. And they do it. They throw in 109. Why? Because pick 10 was originally their pick in the Jamal Adams trade. And pick 109 was originally our pick in the Jamal Adams trade. So this is a boop, boop, beep. Get it all done. 
We made the trade Jamal Adams for DK Metcalf and AVT clean as a whistle. <whistles> right? That's what we're doing. And it's nice and neat. The Seattle Seahawks come up. They grab their quarterback of the future, got him on a nice five-year first-round rookie contract thing, and now they can build their team with inexpensive guys, and they're going to go about it that way for Pete Carroll's last shot at, at building something here, okay? Now, the Jets slide back to number nine, so now we have nine and ten. So who do we take at nine? You saw in the last draft, we went edge. Well, guess what? We're going edge again. We're going edge with, the, in my opinion, the third best edge rusher in the class. As we know, Aiden Hutchinson and Kayvon Thibodeau were taken off this one. So now people are taking Trayvon Walker. They're taking Jermaine Johnson. And sitting there at number nine is George Karloftis, the Greek freak. And we love him. It's, he's third on our board anyway, which is why we felt comfortable trading back. This is the guy we wanted at four anyway. So we went back, gained DK Metcalf, and now we got George Karloftis at pick nine. So what have we done? With one pick in the first round, we've now added and solved our wide receiver position and our edge rusher position in one fell swoop. Okay? Not too bad. Now we're at pick 10. And Pittsburgh's calling. Why is Pittsburgh calling? Malik Willis is gone. Well, because they never wanted Malik Willis in the first place. That was all smokescreen. They want what's been labeled as Kenny Pickettsburg. So they want Kenny Pickett. And they're going to trade up to 10 to get him. And they're going to give us, obviously, pick 20. So we slide back 10 spots. They're going to give us a second round pick this year, pick 52. They're going to give us a second round next year and a sixth round pick next year. Good value for pick 10. It's actually they're overpaying a, a, a smidge of rune, which is about it, which is it's appropriate. If you're the one wanting to move up, you got to you got to make us move back. So they're overpaying a little bit. Couldn't get a first out of them, but we got two seconds and a sixth. So we're going to slide back to 20 and they take Pickett and all is well. Oh, by the way, the Panthers took Matt Corral. That's who they went with, okay? <laughs> if you're wondering. Uh, so now let's move into our draft. So we got George Karloftis and DK Metcalf. We do not need to go wide receiver with our first round pick anymore. So now we're going to switch it up. A lot of people wanted us to go Evan Neal, Icky, Charles Cross. That's what they wanted us to do. Well, now sitting at 20, in our opinion, the second best offensive tackle in the whole draft is sitting right there. So we're going to nab him for value purposes. We're going to bring on our tackle, Trevor Penning. Out of Northern Iowa, six foot seven, three hundred and twenty-one pound animal who dominated the Senior Bowl. As a matter of fact, he got into three or four scuffles with defensive guys because they didn't like how mean he was to them. He was kicking their ass all over the place, and they didn't like it. So Trevor Penning is now a Jet. So we did a first round of DK Metcalf, George Karloftis, and Trevor Penning. I'm very, very happy with this. Even though I don't want tackle in the first round, again, value. I might have wanted linebacker, but I just couldn't pull the trigger. Trevor Penning's there. I can't pass him, right? So now we're going to do some interesting things. We're sitting there at pick 35. We want a safety, but guess who slid through? He was rumored to be a first-round pick back end of the first, but he's not. He's sitting there at pick 35, so we're going to scoop him, and we're going to grab safety Daxton Hill out of Michigan. Six foot, 192 pound safety, speed, versatility. He can play ball safety spots. He can actually play nickel. He can do all kinds of fun stuff for us, which this coaching staff loves. Dax Hill coming to the Jets at pick 35. Now you're going to remember this name from the last draft because we're going to take him again. Why wouldn't I take him again? He's sitting right there at 38. We didn't need to use 35 for him this time. We're going to take linebacker Leo Chanel out of Wisconsin. Again, six foot two, 260 pound monster man running around next to CJ Mosley and Jamie and Sherwood making people regret coming on the field with us. And I love it. Here's where it gets interesting. We just earned pick 52, so we got to make this worth something, right? And a lot of people are wondering if George Karloftis can really be the guy. The Jets know he can. I know he can. But a lot of people are nervous. Oh, shit, is this really how we're going to address 
our edge rusher, I don't even really love him. I wanted Hutchinson. I wanted Trayvon Walker. I wanted Jermaine Johnson or Thibodeau. It's all fine. He's going to be fine. But just in case, we're going to use our extra pick that we got from trading back with the Steelers, our new shiny pick 52, and we're going to grab the other guy who terrorized the Senior Bowl, Boye Mafe. So now we brought in two potentially dominating edge rushers. Why? Well, because we don't know what Carl Lawson's going to be. We got Bryce Huff, but he's been uns unspectacular, solid. But hey, it's time to have some competition, buddy. It's time to have some competition in there. We got Jabari Zuniga. Hey, dude, it's time for you to put up or beat it. It's time. So now we got Boye Mafe and George Karloftis coming into our edge rusher rotation. Jacob Martin brought in. We're starting to get something here. Salah wants to make sure that the edge rush is secure. If this guy can't do it, this guy's gonna, that kind of thing. So we grab Boye Mafe out of Minnesota, 6'4", 265 pound edge at pick 52. Now we're at pick 69. And it's funny because a lot of guys are even talking about this guy going in the first. He's not. I'm just telling you right now. He's not. In my opinion, he's not. He uh, had a great combine that rocketed him up, but a lot of teams are going to be cautious. He's the wide receiver who slides through the second and makes it to the third. And we're going to grab Christian Watson out of North Dakota State. It's a good spot for him. I could see him going in the second, but I could also see him slide into the third. I think everybody's nuts with this first round Christian Watson talk. Six foot four, two hundred and ten pound, raw. He's gonna have a lot to work on in the uh, on, on the next level, but the talent is undeniable. North Dakota State's own Christian Watson at pick sixty nine. Now we got one oh nine in the Seattle trade, so this is also a bonus pick, and we're gonna do the same thing with it. Not exactly the same, but we're gonna grab one of the top five defensive linemen in the whole damn draft by many people's assertions. Fedarian Mathis, defensive tackle, six foot four, three hundred and twelve pound monster, twenty two years old. See what we're doing here? They want to make sure this defensive line is ferocious. So now we got Fedarian Mathis to go with Karloftis and uh, Boye Mafe, hungry snarlers, Leo Chanel. Rah, rah. They want to make people pay, and that's exactly what we're going to do. That brings us to pick 111, and now we're going with the Conor McGregor stuff again. Even though that's a fighter, we're going to go talk about Conor McGovern. Instead, we're going to bring in another guy from the Senior Bowl, versatile guard slash center. Another guy, work ethic, personality, uh, character, all that stuff's there. Cole Strange, the guard center at a Chattanooga State, six foot six, three hundred and one pound. He's another nasty mauler type, and they loved him at the Senior Bowl. I can see him being a fantastic pick at pick 111. Now we go to pick 117, and again in the fourth round, we're going to grab our running back. Surprised to see this guy slide all the way to here, but he is in the middle of a slide, man. Can't explain it, but I love it. We're going to grab Isaiah Spiller, running back the 20-year-old, six foot one, 225-pound bruiser out of Texas A&M. Isaiah Spiller, pick 117 to pair with Michael Carter, Tevin Coleman, and whoever else we keep out of our uh, Michael P. Ryan, Austin Walter, Ty Johnson mess out of those guys. But Isaiah Spiller is going to come in and secure this one-two punch in our running back room. So now we go to pick 146, and we're going to bring in the same tight end. He's there last time. He's there this time. And we're going to grab Jake Ferguson out of Wisconsin, 6'5", 246. And again, they loved him at the Senior Bowl. He did a fantastic job at the Senior Bowl. This is the third Senior Bowl player that we're bringing in now for us. And we love it. Pick 146, addressing the tight end. Completely revamped that room this year. The only guy to stay is Kenny Abo, and I think that's smart. And now we're going to go to our last pick. Pick 163. This guy's not supposed to be there, but he is. He popped through to the fifth round. They're looking at him as a fourth round pick. It's very realistic that he slides through. The other six foot four safety in this draft class, 215 pounds out of Miami, Ohio, Sterling Weatherford, 
the safety who is a bruiser. He's a hitter. Great hands. He's got some raw things that need to get worked on. A little bit sloppy in his angles and things like that. But he's a very, very strong safety candidate. And I think he's going to work in well. So now we added Daxton Hill and Sterling Weatherford in the draft. And this puts Ashton Davis on notice. Hey, they want to work with him. That's great. All the athleticism in the world. Give him another year. If he can't cut it, Sterling Weatherford's right there. He can cut it. He's a football player. He's not a track guy trying to be football. He's a football player. So now we got two safeties and we wrap this up with a six foot four. Uh, crazy demon missile of a safety out there, Sterling Weatherford. So let's recap. Traded with Seattle, four down to nine, brought in DK Metcalf, and then we got George Karloftis at pick nine. Traded back with the Steelers, got pick 52, a second next year, and a sixth next year, and we grabbed Boye Mafe with that one. So we got George Karloftis, DK Metcalf, and Trevor Penning in the first round. Come on. What kind of first round is that? Then we got Daxton Hill and Leo Chanel, a safety and a linebacker in the second. Then we went Boye Mafe with our bonus pick in the seventh for training, or uh, in the second for trading back with the Steelers. Boye Mafe, the second edge we brought in. Then we went in the third, we got Christian Watson, who... Chances are he's not going to be there, but it's very possible that he is. So he grabbed him. That gives us two wide receivers, two edge rushers. We ultimately got two safeties. See what it's going on here? Then we went in the fourth, and we got Fredarian Mathis, defensive tackle. Then we got Cole Strange, the guard center interior offensive madman. We got Isaiah Spiller, the running back from Texas A&M. At pick 117, pick 146, tight end Jake Ferguson, and pick 163, Sterling Weatherford, out of Miami, Ohio. So, why are these best case scenarios? Well, number one, a lot has to happen for this to take place. Now, you might have different preferences with different players. It would be abnormal if you didn't, right? Of course, we all have different guys. We like this one more than that one, and that's totally normal. doesn't mean you suck. It doesn't mean I suck. But when we look at how this broke, look at the trade one. We were able to move back. Karloftis and Aiden Hutchinson are taken. I'm sorry, uh, Kayvon Thibodeau and Aiden Hutchinson are gone in that draft. So getting the value, we could take Karloftis, it would be fine. If that's the guy we want, we could take him there. Nobody would bat an eyelash. But there's the opportunity to squeeze the lemon, which is something that, uh, that the good teams know how to do, man. You know how to squeeze the lemon. If you're going to be able to get the same player a few sp spots back, squeeze the lemon, get DK Metcalf out of it, get 109 out of it. So we got DK Metcalf and Fedarian Mathis out of that slide back. Not a bad deal, man. We basically traded Jamal Adams for DK Metcalf and AVT. I think it's a beautiful trade. Remember, we all wondered, well, we don't even know who they're going to pick. And blah. I think we did okay. I think we did all right. So DK Metcalf, we signed him for four years, $26 million a year or something like that. The cap goes up $30 million next year. No fuss, no muss. We're good. So you look at that. You, you know, you look at that, you know, having to happen, sliding back with the Steelers from 10 to 20. Now, a lot of people might not want to do that. Maybe you want to just grab Devin Lloyd there. And I look, man, I thought about it. But again, I thought being able to get the 52, the second next year, the sixth next year, that was a little bit too much. So you got to ask yourself, is Devin Lloyd better than Trevor Penning, Boye Mafe, a second and a sixth? And my answer is no. So you take it, you bolster your edge, you bolster your tackle pipeline. Trevor Penning's going to be a starter without question. Without question. Now you can have no stress with letting George Fant go if he wants $25 million a year. If Mackay Becton's, you know, if a lot of people's fears come to fruition and he's a bust, you got Trevor Penning. He's there. You see what I'm saying? And you got, now we could have just used pick four and taken Icky or whatever. Sure. But again, look at how we squeeze the lemon. And this is why I talk about best case scenario. Instead of taking Icky at four, we got George Karloftis, DK Metcalf, Boye Mafe, and Trevor Penning. And a second and a six next year instead of just grabbing Icky 
and Lloyd. And then we're able to follow it with Chanel. And if you like, look, you know, Christian Harris is there. Chad Muma was there. Braden and Smith was there. You could take another guy if you want. That's, that's not even the issue. But when you look about how this broke, I think it's fantastic. And this is what I'm hoping. Something along these lines. If you only choose one of the trades, fine. But sliding back from 4-9 to nine for DK Metcalf would be best case. Rather than trading 35, 38, and 69 for DK Metcalf. Now we have no... We, think about that. We pick 4, 10, 111. So you have 101 picks between your picks. That's not the way we want to go. Now, in my opinion, if Joe Douglas does decide to trade that 35, 38, and 69 for somebody, the reason he's comfortable with that is because he already knows he has two slide downs that are going to recoup a lot of that capital. That's what I think. I don't think he's so silly as to leave a vacuum in the middle of his draft that large. Second, third, all the way to 111. It just doesn't sit well with me. So, what do you guys think? Are these your best case scenarios? Oh, say about three or four. Let me know in the comments. I can't wait to hear what you guys think. Maybe tell me. Maybe you like one, two, and three. You don't like four, five, and six. Let me know. I'm curious. I want to know what you guys think. And you, if you don't know, I'll tell you right now, I read every comment. Now, maybe I shouldn't. I spend far too much time doing it, but I at least read every single comment that comes in. I reply to probably 75% of them. So if you got something to say, it's a good place to do it. It's a great place to have our conversation. Let me know. I'm curious if these are your best case scenarios. They are mine, and I think they're both very realistic. Guys, thanks for popping in for episode 65 of this podcast, Green Beans Jets Pod, and have a great day. Go Jets!